We'll call to order the regular May meeting of the Minot City Council. Roll call. Janser? Here. Olson? Here. Padragula? Sitma? Here. Strait? Here. Wolski? Here. Barney? Here. Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance. Eight seven seven zero, also known as Township One Fifty Three North Eighty Nine West Section Thirty One, to Sixty One Eleven Thirty Seventh Avenue Southeast, also known as East Quarter, East One Half Southeast Southeast Southwest, South Thirty Four One Fifty Five Eighty Two Nedro South Four A Five. That's Committee of the Whole from the May Second um, Agenda Item Number One. Is there anybody in the audience to care to comment on this public hearing? Anybody care to comment on this public hearing? Third time, anybody here to comment on this public hearing? Need a motion? Alderman Strait. Uh, Mr. Mover, uh, Mr. Mayor, excuse <laughs> me. <clears throat> uh, I'd move that we uh, close the public hearing and uh, move the item. Second. Seconded by Olson. Discussion? Discussion on the motion? Call the roll. Straight? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Barney? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Item number seven is another public hearing. A public hearing to consider the request from Clay Burns to relocate the single family residence and garage from 1430 First Avenue Southeast also known as Lennox Park Edition, Lot 42, to 605 17th Street Northwest, also known as Blaisdell Bird Edition, Lot 7, Block 9. This is Committee of the Whole Agenda from the May 2nd meeting, item number two. Is there anybody else in the audience that cares to comment on this public hearing? Anybody here to comment on this public hearing? Anybody here to comment on this public hearing? If not, I need a motion. Mr. Mayor, I would oh. make a motion to close the public hearing and approve the item. Uh, moved by uh, Sitma, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Janser. Discussion on the motion? Discussion on the motion? Call the roll. Sitma? Yes. Strait? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Barney? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Motion carries. Item number eight is another public hearing. A public hearing to consider a request by Christopher Owen to relocate the single family residence from 103 4th Avenue Northwest, also known as Oakland Park Edition, Lot 8, Block 2, to 110 4th Avenue Northwest, also known as Ramstead's 3rd Edition, Lot 3, Block 1. It's Committee of the Whole Agenda item from, May, from the May 2nd meeting, item number three. Is there anybody in the audience care to comment on this public hearing? 
Anybody here to comment on this public hearing? Any comments? Seeing no one, I need a motion. Alderman Janser. Mr. Mayor, I move we close the public hearing and approve the item. Second. Seconded by Olson. Discussion on the motion. Discussion on the motion. Call the roll. Janser. Yes. Olson. Yes. Sitma. Yes. Straight. Yes. Wolski. Yes. Barney. Yes. That takes us to item number nine. Personal appearances. This is on the agenda for people to address the City Council on any item that is not on tonight's agenda. So if you have something that you want to discuss that is not on the agenda, let us know and we will take your comments now. Seeing no one, uh, item number 10 is the Mayor's Report. Um, unfortunately, I have a fairly lengthy one tonight. But um, I want to bring you all up to date on uh, the Mayor's Committee on Addiction. Uh, on March 6, we had a, a meeting here to, uh, with the, the chairman of the subcommittees, and we made final edit changes to the uh, document uh, that was released to the uh, Mayor's Committee. And uh, after that meeting, I attended a planning commission meeting where the um, uh, a residence was approved by the planning committee for women, uh, a sober living facility for women. Uh, that went through, I'm, I'm pleased to say. Uh, on April 11th, Minot Public Schools hosted an opioids meeting in Arville Graveling Theater that was attended by a large number of people with great discussion. I was at that. And then on April 18th, I sent a letter to the First Lady of North Dakota with a copy of the report that I have here. And I'm just gonna take a minute and read some of the more uh, uh, salient points in that. Um, I started off with uh, identifying the committee, which I'm gonna do it uh, a little bit later in my report uh, when I thank them. But the committee was a large committee, and I felt it was necessary to ensure all areas of the community that deal with addiction were represented. It also helped identify silos, gaps, and roadblocks that interfere with a successful fight with addiction. The committee identified four key areas of focus, education and outreach, health and safety, treatment and family services, recovery care and aftercare. The full committee then broke down into subcommittees to address these areas in greater detail. The full committee, with all, all uh, like a dozen people, held nearly a dozen public meetings and the combined subcommittees conducted more than 40 additional meetings beyond that. During the course of our work, we were able to secure more than $400,000 in grants, including one from the Bush Foundation, to continue our study and organize the resources in Minot. Attached, you will find the first draft of our report, which illustrates best practices for our community, obstacles to those seeking help, services available, and gaps in services. This dynamic and evolving document will serve as a roadmap as the Minot community moves forward combating addiction. As you may be aware, after a long and enjoyable career, I've chosen to step away from public service and I'm not running for re-election as Minot's mayor. I am confident that the work done by this committee will serve as a blueprint for recovery in Minot and surrounding area and I'm certain that uh, whoever replaces me up here will uh, have as much of a commitment as I. Um, so I sent that along with a copy of the report to the First Lady, and I wanted to also take a moment to uh, thank the committee that worked on this. We spent a, a lot of time. Uh, they spent even more time and put their heart and soul into this project. Uh, Paul Strokeland was one of the uh, um, the, the initiators of bringing this, uh, this problem to our eyes uh, uh, was a parent. Patty Eisenzimmer was another parent who was very active on the committee. Sheriff Bob Barnard from Ward County, Chief Olson from Minot PD, uh, Steve Hall with uh, North Dakota Parole and Probation, Lisa Clute from First District Health, Chris Ray, uh, Ward County Jail, <coughs> Connie Tyler with Community Medical Services, Vale Potter, Ward County Drug Court, Dr. Mark Vollmer, Superintendent of Minot Public Schools, Lori Gosvesley, North Central Human Services, Dr. Jeff Sather, Chief of Medicine at Trinity Medical Center, Shannon Strait, uh, Alderman, uh, Stephen Padragula, Alderman, and Rosa Larson, Ward County State's Attorney. 
all of them, that was the, the main committee, and then they broke off into subcommittees to uh, delve deeper into the issue. In addition to thanking those folks, I also want to thank Megan Lautenschlager. She uh, volunteered her time and services to craft the, the paperwork that we use in order to secure those $400,000 in grants. And she contacted me last week and has another grant that she wants me to work on before, uh, before I go. I also want to thank Mas uh, Pastor Mark Free for his coordination with the pastoral group that we met with. Uh, and they were going to be providing uh, um, faith-based solutions for uh, opioids and addiction that uh, we did not have access to, and I wanted to thank him for that. Um, the other person I want to thank is Kelly Metelka, who uh, took the minutes and was really the person that kept us all on task and making sure that everything got done the way it was supposed to be done, and I want to thank her as well. So uh, thank you, all, all of you that uh, participated in this. <clears throat> the next steps, as I've said several times uh, publicly, the next steps is to release the document that, I, that we have. We have it in an electronic format on the city's website. Uh, I intend to dissolve this committee as of tonight and encourage the next mayor to appoint action committees specific to the plan that we came up with during our, our deliberation. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm certain that uh, the new mayor will, will continue that good work because it's what's best for our community. So that kind of summarizes and concludes the uh, Mayor's Committee on Addiction. It's not a solution, I want to make that very clear, but it is the roadmap to improving uh, the, the, the hope for, the, for those that are afflicted by addiction. And as we move forward, uh, I, I can't help but think it's going to be successful. Additional duties, uh, on March 28th, uh, I participated in the groundbreaking for flood protection of, excuse me, uh, by uh, 16th Street. Uh, on April 4th, I spoke to the Downtown Business and Professionals Organization regarding the Main Street Initiative. And uh, I, I took to them this, the specific um, suggestions that came out of a meeting that we held in Bismarck uh, uh, put on by the governor on uh, what we need to do to keep Main Street vibrant. On uh, April 13th, I represented the city at Minot Air Force Base for Chief Elliott's retirement. On April 14th, I represented the city at the Military Ball. On April 17th, I judged Minot Public School students' designs for the remodeling of City Hall. We did that right in here. On April 20th, I represented the city at the MSU Board of Regents meeting. On April 25th, I participated in a brand new podcast called The Minotian. And on April 26th, I represented the city at the, Mi at the Minot Police Department Memorial for Fallen Police Officers. Uh, Aaron Moss was instrumental in putting that together and put in an awful lot of work and effort. I want to recognize him for all that work and helping us remember those that uh, paid the ultimate price for uh, protecting us. So, if, Aaron, if you want to come up here for a minute. I've been telling the police what to do. <laughs> I don't get to do it very often. I believe there are some appointments on your desk. Oh, I also, one last thing, I represent the city at the Native American powwow at Minot State University on April 27th. And we also have two Boy Scout troops, I believe. I believe we have Troop 416 over here. <coughs> Stand up and be recognized, gentlemen. Fred, you can sit down. <laughs> I said, gentlemen. <laughs> and also, I believe we have some uh, Boy Scouts from 425. Please stand up and be recognized. And it's <laughs> are there any other Boy Scouts in the audience tonight? Hmm. 
And I believe I'm meeting with you after tonight's meeting, correct? Okay. Um, and then we have appointments. Mr. Mayor, I move your appointments. Second. Moved by Janser, seconded by SITMA. Discussion on the appointments. Discussion on the appointments. Call the roll. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. SITMA? Yes. Stray? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Barney? Yes. That concludes my report. Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. <clears throat> Just wanted to say before I begin, uh, it's an exciting night uh, for a number of different reasons. Um, one of those reasons is that we are uh, fi finally on our public access channel this evening. So we're streaming on that and we'll be doing so f in meetings uh, coming into the future. If I uh, could also take just a quick moment, I wanted to recognize you, Mr. Mayor, for your leadership in the Opioid Committee. Uh, that's a tremendous and important work for our community, and I just wanted to recognize you publicly and appreciate all of your leadership on that as an outstanding, uh, not just result, but in public process and in local governance. So thank you very much for what you've done for our community on that front. I have one more meeting, so don't get too excited. Okay. <laughs> All right, with that, we'll just jump right into uh, the important dates coming up over the next month. I'll just uh, draw your attention to um, a couple of forums, the City Council Forum, which will be held at 6.30 on uh, the 23rd of this month at the North Dakota State Fair Center. Uh, and then the uh, Minot Mayor's Forum will be held at the Grand Hotel at 6.30 p.m. on the 24th of this month. Uh, the Committee of the Whole and the Planning Commission uh, because of the holiday, keep in mind we're going to be closed uh, for the Memorial Day holiday. Uh, the Planning Commission gets moved to Tuesday the 29th at 6.30. The Committee of the Whole will be prior to that at 4.15 that same day, uh, followed by uh, on the 30th another Committee of the Whole meeting, and then finally City Council at 6.30 uh, here on the 4th of June. Wanted to update you uh, quickly on the FEMA risk maps. You may recall that back in November we held a very large meeting uh, for several hours with uh, members of the United States Geological Survey, uh, FEMA, the State Department of North Dakota, or excuse me, uh, State of North Dakota, um, and a lot of other organizations, Army Corps of Engineers, county staff, city staff, where we talked for a long time about the uh, preliminary maps that were developed by FEMA uh, to characterize our community as it related to floodway and floodplain mapping. Um, we were given an opportunity to, uh, to learn from them and also take the information that they had provided preliminarily and evaluate that information and make comment to that information. <laughs> I'm pleased to say that uh, you know that we submitted comments to uh, FEMA uh, and the state in regard to those maps and we've recently held another meeting with them to talk about the comment uh, processing, meaning the information that they took from us and then churned and came back to share with us uh, back in April, and so I wanted to let you know that uh, the city, its consultants, the county, and other representatives, uh, and I do want to make a shout out to Ryan Ackerman and his team over at Ackerman Esfold for helping the city on this, because they were very instrumental in, in uh, helping us to evaluate those preliminary maps. Uh, we identified that uh, guidance documents that were used in the development of the preliminary <laughs> maps were actually outdated by uh, FEMA, and so we petitioned for them to use the new guidance uh, and to apply that new guidance document for floodway mapping, which they have agreed to do. When they did that work, and they did this work at their expense, essentially they found out that there were several revisions that needed to be made. So they um, are in the process now of revising the flood maps uh, using the updated in, uh, information or the flood guidance, floodway mapping guidance document. This is great news for Minot on a couple of different levels because this will result in improved maps for our region, which will be much more accurate and representative of the information uh, and the best available science that's been identified in the guidance document. It will also um, delay the map implementation, which in some ways is good for us because this will allow us to in the interim build or continue to build community rating system points, which will allow us to move more toward an adjustment to the flood insurance premium rates, and it will also allow us time to advance flood control projects, which will have also an impact on these maps going forward. That being said, I do want to remind uh, you, as well as our community, that uh, these maps are really just risk maps. 
So even though the maps don't necessarily go into effect now for what will likely be a year's delay, the risk still exists. And we want to make sure that our community is aware of those risks and does what it, what it feels is in its best interest to mitigate for those risks. And of course, we always recommend uh, purchasing flood insurance. So uh, that's just a quick update there. I wanted to show you what one of the maps, there are several maps throughout our region uh, like this one that show the changes between what the preliminary maps were, um, were proposing and what the new maps are now proposing. Uh, for example, <clears throat> when we compare the new maps to the June 9th maps that were uh, of last year that were developed, we know that there have been um, several uh, revisions, and those revisions include um, a reduction of about 35% in the number of impacted structures in the floodway. That's huge for us. Um, we also had a significant reduction in the number of um, acreage that was also added. Uh, for example, the uh, current calculations show that 72 acres were added in the floodway with this revision, but 167 acres were removed from the floodway. Uh, so these are important numbers for us because what we're able to do is take more and more properties and structures out of the floodway by using the updated guidance. So I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, next, we'll move on to the risk map schedule. Uh, as I mentioned, in November, we had the preliminary map discussions. Uh, in April, as I mentioned, we had the community meeting, or the, excuse me, comment meeting. The comments were being uh, adjusted or being taken in by FEMA and being adjusted by FEMA staff, and a revised preliminary map is slated to come out at the very end of this year, so December of 2018. There will be a, begin a 90-day appeals period on March or in and around March of 2019. Uh, by August of 2019, all appeal comments should be provided. And then about September time or so, the letter of determin final determination will be developed. And finally, the map effective date will occur about six months later in March of 2020. I will stress, um, as FEMA has stressed to us, this is the earliest possible time frame. It is likely that it will be later than these dates. But I just wanted to mention uh, that uh, you know this has been a work in process for some time, and uh, this is the schedule that they provided to us at the April meeting. Uh, moving on to the High Water Initiative project. Uh, this was kind of an interesting project. I know that you've been uh, kind of kept abreast as we've gone along. We, uh, we are trying to ensure that this community doesn't forget about the 2011 flood. And by doing so, we've created an initiative to establish uh, signs around our community, in this case about 12 to 15 si locations, where signs will be placed on uh, various power poles or other poles that will identify where the flood level was in 2011. We were looking for a sign that would be representative and informative for our community and uh, held a, uh, a uh, contest where multiple uh, sign rend renderings were established or, or provided to the city. Uh, there were two options. These were two, two of the uh, finalist options that were presented. Uh, option one did finally win out, but just narrowly by 51% uh, compared to 49%. Uh, this is pretty exciting, though, for our community. We intend to uh, initiate this project on around uh, June 25th. So we'll have an unveiling, and we'll, we'll actually have a, um, some information and a ceremony to, to unveil this. So we're pretty excited about this project as well. Moving forward. Wanted to give you a brief update on uh, some various construction projects around town. I, I, we don't have time to go into all of them, so I'll just hit the highlights here. Uh, first of all, let's talk about uh, phase one, phase two, and phase three of flood control. I'll be very brief here because uh, Mr. Ackerman and uh, some of his team members had provided a pretty extensive update at the last committee, the whole meeting. So I won't go into all of those details. I just wanted to hit uh, the public impact details. And that is to say that the relocation of the Bark Park is going to be necessitated by these projects. Uh, and uh, so the Bark Park is going to be located on the north side of 7th Avenue near the bypass. Uh, the, the path that's going to be atop the existing levee uh, has also been closed and is going to be removed. There will be a temporary closure of Forest Road uh, and intersection uh, of 7th Avenue Southwest and 20th Street Southwest. And then finally, there will be permanent road closures on 3rd Avenue Southwest uh, east of 15th Street and Forest Road west of 16th Street. So as these projects continue, there will be more disruptions along the way that uh, the public should be aware of. Uh, we'll try to minimize the inconvenience to the traveling public and also neighbors and those sorts of things. 
Uh, but this is important work, as you all know, for our community. Next, I wanted to talk about the Broadway Bridge replacement a demo of the old bridge. This is the last remaining bridge. The southbound lanes is essentially about 60% complete. Uh, they are already constructing the new bridge uh, in its place. And uh, there's still a lot of coordination happening between the contractors and the uh, railroads, which is going nicely. Uh, keep in mind for drivers that there's no left turn on 4th Avenue going west. Uh, that's important to keep in mind. And that will be for some time. And then uh, lastly, at least at this stage of the game, the project remains on schedule for a late fall completion. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, you'll also notice that they've been making some, um, um, some what you call, uh, handrail and gating and that sort of stuff, uh, improvements on the northbound lane, which was not able to get accomplished last year. So uh, that, that's looking out to be very nice as well. Lastly, uh, off for 83 bypass, wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some, what, some of what's going to happen here at the intersection of the 83 bypass and Highway 252. There'll be a lot of different uh, impacts starting essentially today. Uh, these impacts look like this. There's going to be head-to-head -head traffic going north and south on the bypass for several, uh, for, for quite some time here. The southbound uh, lane onto Highway 2, 2 and 52 is going to be just one lane southbound, uh, which you could either turn right, go straight, or turn left off of. So it's going to be a bit of a bottleneck here. Uh, also, there's only going to be one westbound lane through the intersection of Highway 2 and, and 52. Uh, which is also going to bottleneck traffic kind of towards the east as well. Uh, the work is estimated to take just about maybe the period of the month or so, and we do hope to get that done uh, as soon as we can. As part of the widening uh, to the north, where we have uh, the overpass of 83 and 4th Avenue, uh, there's going to be no through traffic uh, starting probably the end of this month or so that's going to be allowed on the overpass. Instead, traffic will be rerouted onto the west on and off ramps. Uh, and that's to allow for work that's going to need to be accomplished in order to accommodate existing work uh, with regard to the, uh, the uh, widening of the roadway and the bridge work that needs to, be, uh, needs to be accomplished to get that done. So there's really no specific time just yet, but we believe about later in May that uh, this will be begin, and it'll, of course, take some time. Uh, so we apologize again for that inconvenience as well. Just to update you on the uh, National Disaster Resiliency uh, work that we've been doing, the downtown gathering space, as you know, has, uh, has been proceeding nicely. And with your approval this evening, uh, we will be able to process the substantial amendment. If that does happen, then the public comment period is slated to start tomorrow. We'll run 30 days. Uh, there is also a public meeting that's been scheduled in anticipation of your approval this evening. That'll happen um, uh, in just a few weeks. The affordable housing uh, component of the NDR programs uh, is, pro is proceeding nicely as well. Uh, the GAP financing program, which was launched in February, already has 18 applicants, which is nice to see. Uh, there is going to be a Q&A session on May 8th for the Downtown Multifamily Housing Project RFPs. Uh, the RFQ for the housing design book is being developed now. We do hope to bring that back to you uh, in June, hopefully at the Committee of the Whole. Uh, then work also continues at the Park South project. And uh, we do hope that the project will be uh, completed by about mid to late summer this year. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, the family shelter, we are awaiting a proposal submission from the uh, family shelter advisory group. And then lastly, on the acquisition program, uh, the bids have been open for the contractor, which has been identified for demo. And um, also, we have the home sweet home demolition, which is going to be scheduled following approval of the contractor here shortly. So wanted to just stop for a second and kind of update you on the acquisitions piece of where we're at in flood control uh, because we're, we're, we're watching these funds dwindle quickly as we advance our flood control uh, projects. And so with that, I wanted to just uh, alert you to sort of the funds that are remaining both in acquisitions, funds that are remaining in relocation and in demolition. So on the very right-hand side, you can see the budget and what's been spent. And then on the left-hand side, you can see the total funds that are um, are remaining. And there's no plan necessarily finalized for the state money yet because we are looking to uh, petition the state legislature this next biennium for more money uh, to help us with the acquisitions. Um, we are short about 8 to $10 million just for the current acquisitions that we'll need 
for flood control. Uh, so this is a priority for us. And then um, I did want to mention also that the more of these properties we take off of the tax roll, the more of a, um, a financial hit that is for the city as well. So, so far we have taken off uh, almost $40 million worth of tax value by acquiring properties throughout the city. This, of course, places a bigger burden on those properties that remain, especially as it relates to uh, continuing to finance uh, flood control and, uh, and other operational uh, costs as well. So I just wanted to point that out um, as we move on. Tom? Yes. Uh, the, the dollars you were just showing us, uh, are those NDR dollars or those state dollars? Uh, are, are they both included in this? I'm just curious. Yes. Um, my understanding is that both are included. Let me turn to, are they not? Is it just NDR? Just NDR. Just NDR. Sorry about that. Yeah. Very good. Other questions? All right. On the parking structures, uh, there's been quite a bit of work done on this as well. Uh, most of this was presented to you during the committee as a whole through the transition plan. Uh, so I won't read all of this, but there is a, an enormous amount of work that has already been completed in the short time that we've taken management and operational control over those structures. That appears on the left side of the screen. A lot of things that we're still in process, which is in the middle of the screen. And then uh, uh, longer term, we have a, quite a bit of work to do. Um, in, uh, in regards to the parking ramps and, and long-term plans for those parking ramps going forward. So that, that's uh, sort of on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, I am pretty proud of the team. I want to appreciate and uh, thank uh, Lance Meyer and also Dan Jonason for their assistance and their staff's assistance in helping to put the transition uh, plan together and, uh, and working that plan so that we are as far along as we are at this point in time. They've done a really nice job with this, and I'm, I'm grateful for their time and effort on it. Wanted to also briefly touch on uh, some exciting news. <clears throat> the city of uh, Minot, uh, our downtown, is actually going to be included in the governor's uh, submission for census tracts to the United States Department of Treasury. Uh, and if accepted, the downtown Minot would be designated as a new opportunity zone, which would allow it um, some significant federal uh, tax um, benefits to those who are looking to invest in our community. There's uh, quite a bit more information that's been shared, I think, with you both in email and uh, is included also on our website. So I turn you to that. But uh, this is pretty exciting because with Renaissance Zone uh, designations uh, and also with the Opportunity Zones and other designations, we continue to push for our downtown to be a very attractive place to invest. Um, and, uh, and that's really the point to revitalizing our downtown. So we're doing some very, very great things there. Wanted to touch base on the landfill expansion just quickly also. We did hold a neighborhood meeting um, with the impacted, or most, mostly the impacted and affected community members. So we sent about 430 uh, letters in and around, uh, to neighbors in and around the uh, landfill. We had probably 100 or so folks that attended the meeting. Uh, as you might imagine, uh, this meeting is, uh, and the subject matter for that matter, is, uh, is, is one that's uh, fairly emotional for many people. Um, it was great to have the members of the community that came out to talk with us about this and for us to be able to share and have an exchange on kind of the process forward. Um, as we explained to the community members that did attend, uh, we're going through an iterative process and this process will include continual meetings uh, to make sure that we can identify all the issues that the community members have and to make sure that our consultants and our staff can identify and respond to every one of those issues for our community. I think one of the things that, uh, that I have found in, in uh, the short time that I've been on this project with the staff is that, uh, you know, much to, I think, maybe even some of our community members' surprise, this has been a discussion topic in our community for the better part of almost two decades. In fact, we have found um, a documentation back to 2004 and 2005 where the Public Works Committee and the Safety Committee, as well as the Council, has discussed this. And uh, they even entertained an offer for the very same property that we've purchased uh, back then at $3,000 an acre, which uh, I think the community and council uh, was concerned about that price at that point in time. Uh, and ultimately, that never did come to fruition. But this expansion has been talked about for some time. Uh, we have promised to the community that uh, we will be looking at all options, including not just the expansion option, but we'll also be looking at new siting options as well. And so. Uh, we appreciate uh, the support of the City Council not too long ago for allowing us to 
um, to add that work to the project and to go through a, a complete siting analysis as well as a cost, uh, cost comparative analysis as well. That'll be great for our community. So stay tuned, additional meetings will be set. In addition, we are creating a focus group of uh, uh, various community members. That focus group will be identifying certain industry and community and um, uh, other leadership uh, positions around the city that we'd like to have a small group come in and, and really help us through this process. So uh, that's being uh, developed right now. Uh, I don't think we have anybody yet that we've invited. Uh, but uh, soon the staff will be reaching out and trying to get folks who are interested to attend that focus group, uh, which will help to, uh, again, lead the work of the team. All right, budget workshops are just around the corner. Uh, if uh, you approve the project or the budget schedule uh, that was included in your committee, the whole packet uh, this evening, then the budget workshops will be slated for June 14th and the 21st from 4 o'clock to 6.30 in the evening. They will be held over at the same place we had them last year, which is the auditorium room 203, I believe. Um, there will be several components to the workshop. The first, um, the, the June 14th workshop will be primarily focused on uh, government budgeting, uh, revenues and expenses, that sort of stuff, as well as current and historical challenges. And then uh, finally talk a little bit about the uh, current financial position of the city. Uh, if all goes to plan, we'll stop there. And then in the second meeting, we'll talk about the options going forward. This will be a little bit different than we held the budget workshops or the format we held last year. Last year was more sort of educational. Um, while certainly we intend that to be the case uh, on the June 14th uh, workshop and for part of the June 21st workshop, we have devoted uh, quite a bit of time for discussion. So that way we can get ideas as it relates to the alternatives that we're going to provide and ultimately the recommendation we hope to be able to have for you at that point in time as well. So that's the plan at now, or the plan for now. And uh, that is subject to change as we get, you know, closer and closer. But, uh, but that is hopefully what we'll be able to provide for you at that point. Uh, we've got a lot of questions about street sweeping and a few complaints. So I thought it would be helpful for uh, the community to see what the street sweeping schedule looks like. Uh, the city is being divided up into four quadrants, kind of as you can see here on the map, and each of those quadrants will be addressed at various times. The northwest between April 30th and May 11th, the southwest between May 21st and 1st, uh, the southeast between June 4th and 15th, and then finally the northeast quadrant between June 18th and 29th. So we wanted to make sure that's uh, information also on our website. We want to get it out here in the public as well. A couple other important announcements coming forward. Uh, the Household Hazardous Waste and the Electronics Waste or e-waste collection event will happen this weekend. Um, really, it will be Friday and Saturday from 8 to 5 p.m. and it will be located in Public Works at the Public Works facility. Uh, we, you know, we take oils, paint stains, cell phones, computers, all kinds of other electronics and those sorts of things. Uh, so bring all that stuff out and help us dispose of that, uh, that uh, waste properly, if you will. Uh, finally, uh, spring cleanup week is uh, not just, it's not that far away. We have uh, May 14th through the 18th where we'll be doing clean spring, uh, uh, clean spring cleanup. And uh, the types of things that we'll be taking uh, at the curbside include quantities of bulk and household materials, trash, uh, other items like appliances, furniture, junk, those types of things. Most of the community is familiar with this. They love this, uh, this program, and the complaint that we get is that we don't do it enough. So we'll have to evaluate whether or not we can maybe throw a few more days in uh, throughout the, uh, the year, uh, but at least, uh, at least this isn't too far away for most of our citizens. I wanted to also update the uh, City Council quickly on the Storm Readiness Achievement Award that we've, uh, or designation that we've received. Uh, Ward County and the City of Minot partnered together and, uh, and are now been recognized as a storm ready community. This is really great for us for a couple different reasons. Um, I'll share those with you in just a moment, but the types of things that we had to do are here on the screen. You know, we had to make sure that we could prove that we had a 24-hour warning point and emergency operations center, that we had more than one way to receive severe weather warnings, that we could create a system that monitors weather conditions locally, um, and that we pr promote the importance of being ready for storms. Uh, and that we develop a formal hazardous weather plan, including training for severe weather spotters and holding emergency exercises. All this stuff's been done uh, in concert with uh, Ward County, and I do want to thank Amanda Schooling and her team at Ward County and uh, Dan and, and our team here in the city for working on this and getting this designation. 
Uh, the, the real benefit for this designation is that this applies to points on the community rating system. So as we continue to advance hardscape improvements like flood control projects, um, we're also doing what we can with these types of programs to minimize the impact to our citizens and by helping them to reduce ultimately the, um, the costs of the premiums for flood insurance. So another really great program and a great feather in our cap as well. Uh, you may have uh, heard a little bit about this last week in Committee of the Whole, but just quickly, mostly for the community, I wanted to point out the, that the Minot International Airport, under the leadership of uh, uh, Rick Feltner and his team, have done an outstanding job two years in a row now. Uh, we've had two very clean FAA Part 139 certification inspections. These are difficult inspections, um, and typically these inspections uh, last about three or four days, and it's essentially a cavity search of, of the operations of the airport. And uh, to not get one single finding two years in a row is a tremendous accomplishment for the men and women uh, and the leaders operating our international airport. So a huge thank you to them and for their leadership on this. Uh, this is an outstanding um, accolade for our community, and it, it goes also to the, one of the comments that was made last week in regard to airport safety. Um, this certification should help prop up the, 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 uh, the airport as being one of the best operated and safest uh, airports in our, in our country. So we're very excited about this uh, certification as well. They'll be back next year, as they always are. It's an annual inspection. Moving on to the fire department, we have nine new recruits, I'm proud to say. Um, this is great news for us. We do hope that all the recruits will make it to the graduation which will be May 25th at uh, Fire Station 1 at 3.30, and we hope that you'll meet and congratulate them there as well. Some sad news to report in the fire department. After nearly 31 years of working for the city of Minot, uh, he, he breaks the mold as it relates to the retention issues that we're kind of struggling with. He's been 31 years with the city of Minot, which we're very, very proud of. Uh, Assistant Fire Chief Dean Lennertz will be retiring this month. He started as a firefighter in 1987 and has worked himself up the ladder uh, to becoming assistant fire chief in uh, 2016. We're very proud of him and his accomplishments. We do hope, however, that he won't go away. Uh, there is some, uh, the work, some work for him if he would like it as it relates to doing some inspections and those kinds of things on a part-time basis maybe going forward. Um, no pressure for Mr. Leonard's on that, uh, maybe just a little. <laughs> But anyway, I do want to recognize Dean for that. This is a tremendous accomplishment. Are you here, Dean? He's not. OK. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anyway, we'll move on then. Um, <clears throat> the library and our building inspection and, uh, and building department inspection uh, department have teamed up together. You might say, what? You know, what's going on here with building and the library? Well, as you may know, the um, VISTAs that we had on for the last year, one of their assignments or, or activities that they chose to work on was to create a tool library. So in our public library, we also have a tool library now, you know, different kinds of tools and other sorts of things to help, you know, folks around, uh, around our community uh, have access to equipment to, that, uh, or, or tools that they can use to, you know, do whatever projects they have in their home. Uh, to promote this, we also had uh, the, bu the building and inspection staff come out and hold uh, workshops. We've held two workshops so far. Uh, we were pretty pleased with the attendance, um, particularly because these were kind of new workshops for us. But uh, we had a deck you know, workshop where, we're, where we had staff come out and talk about uh, how to build decks and the permitting process, what kind of permits to get, and those sorts of things. And the same, the same thing happened as well with the uh, sink insulation workshop. We're pretty excited about this. Uh, hopefully there will be more of these moving forward. Um, but it's really great for, uh, for our citizens, it's really great for the library, and also for our inspection staff uh, in regard to outreach and education as it relates to, to uh, home improvements. I wanted to, uh, we're near the end of my report, so I wanted to ask uh, Captain John Klug and also um, Chief Jason Olson to come up. And Mayor, you are welcome to join us as well, please. Uh, we do have some life-saving awards that we wanted to uh, to hand out uh, for outstanding work by a couple of our police officers. So with that, I'll turn over to, uh, to Chief Jason Olson. Uh, thank you, Manager Barry and Mayor Barney and members of the council. Uh, thank you for giving us a few minutes. I'd like to ask Officer Christian Shade to come up. Uh, council, uh, Christian is one of our newest officers and we're very glad to have him aboard. He's been with us for about five months now. 
and he's progressing well with his training. And uh, I also want to ask Senior Officer Andy Melhoff to come up. Andy has been with us for about five and a half years, and Andy takes on, in addition to his normal duties, he is a field training officer for us and does outstanding work teaching the new officers how to do their jobs. And very, very proud to have Andy on our department. I consider Andy a rock star. So he's, a, he's an excellent police officer for our community. So with that, uh, Captain John Klug is vice president of the North Dakota Peace Officers Association, and he's going to present them with some awards. North Dakota Peace Officers Association received the Lifesaver Award nomination um, on February 14th. I read as follows. On February 11th, 2018, at approximately 3.09 p.m., uh, Worth County deputies and community ambulance were dispatched to the residence in East Ridge Acres just on the east edge of Minot uh, and is located in this county. Uh, the call came out of a female that was unconscious and had possibly overdosed. Although this call was within Worth County, Senior Officer Melhoff and his trainee at the time, Officer Chris Fitzpaid, responded to assist. Upon their arrival, they found the female laying on the floor. She was not breathing and turning color. One other subject on scene stated the unconscious female may be a heroin user. Officer Melhoff administered two doses of Narcan and uh, the two officers took up the AD and followed the instructions to begin CPR. Uh, after several chest compressions, community ambulance uh, arrived on scene and took over. The female was transported to Trinity emergency room by community ambulance and the 29 year old female survived um, thanks to their help. Um, so when we consider this uh, as the, uh, the North Dakota Peace Officer Association, we uh, review it as the following. The Life Saving Award is given to a law enforcement officer that by his or her actions significantly contributes to the saving of a human life. And we vote unanimously that they both deserve that award. So. <laughs> well, thank you and congratulations again. Uh, with that, uh, that concludes my presentation and report for the City Council for this month. I'll stand for any questions you might have. Yeah. I'll uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Tom, I guess, uh, just to start, that example of the saving of a life, uh, I think really speaks to the Mayor's work. Uh, and the importance of moving that work forward, Mr. Mayor. So I did want to talk about that right now because just before I arrived tonight, I watched a news story about an instance just like that. But over the course of the year, there was follow-up within the community. And, and I think that speaks to we have to think differently about how we're going to approach this. So I hope that we can figure out a, a process where we can go back and visit this individual as a way to, to further the discussion uh, about the opioid situation that we have. So I, I did want to speak to that and Mr. Mayor, reassure you as, as the lone committee member from the council that will be sitting up here next year, I will see to it that whoever takes over as mayor will, will take that on immediately. So I want you to uh, rest assured with that. Tom, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, are we going to be posting uh, press releases throughout the summer, the construction season, for the general public to know traffic changes? Is that just on the city website, or are there other modes that we're sharing that information with the public? Because a lot of people have voiced their frustration already. 
Uh, thank you, Alderman Strait. Uh, we are actually, every Friday, we get uh, new road construction maps that are sent out by the engineering department. Uh, we also include this on our website. Uh, it's difficult sometimes because these things change weekly, you know, traffic patterns and, and which way people are going and where we're at in various projects do change rapidly or frequently. So that does make it a challenge. If people are concerned and they have construction either in the, in the, um, in the, in their, in their way that they're getting to and from places, they should check the website. Uh, that's certainly being updated. Uh, or if they have uh, impacts associated with things that are going on in a neighborhood, again, they should check the website as well. It's just very difficult um, to constantly try to get out. I mean, we, we send stuff out in our city newsletter, but that's a monthly, that's a monthly publication. Um, press releases do go out for notable uh, major changes and those sorts of things, but at this point in time, the website's really the best way to get information. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, back in. Alderman Stray. Uh, Mr. Berry, can you give us a little status report on what's happening with Trinity Hospital and the expansion that I, we keep hearing? We get phone calls. Um, I kind of expected that to be on Committee of the Whole this month, but it doesn't seem to be. Or what's happening so we can inform the public because the public doesn't believe anything's happening. So. <laughs> well, I've, I've been assured by, uh, by Mr. Kutch at Trinity that uh, quite a bit of activity is going on. Um, in fact, uh, the updates that uh, he's been providing me include that they have gotten all of their financing in order as of the end of last year. All of their bonds were issued, essentially sold, if you will. Uh, they are planning for a June groundbreaking. And so sometime in the middle of June, they'd like to have uh, the city and other community partners come out and partake in that groundbreaking ceremony with them. Uh, we continue to work with them internally on coordinating some of the plan review and construction and inspection related activities. Uh, we are working through some issues of concern as it relates to um, uh, permit fees and those costs as, and they may come to the city council to ask for your assistance uh, in regard to helping resolve some concerns associated with those, uh, those permit fees. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're struggling with is that this will be probably one of the largest construction projects in our community, and we're just not resourced for a project like this. So we'll be needing to consult services, uh, using consulting services to help us with the plan review and inspection process. Of course, that adds some cost to the project. And, uh, and they're concerned about that as well. So we continue to work on this uh, with Trinity staff, but I'm assured that uh, they are moving forward and that they expect a groundbreaking in June of this of this year. Okay. Any other questions? Dr. Mr. Strait. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for indulging me. Uh, Tom, I just wanted to provide a brief update. Uh, a group of us were in Rapid City over the weekend, uh, meeting with Dan Sempner, Destination Rapid City. They run the Main Street Square in downtown Rapid City. It's been in existence for eight years. Uh, Destination Rapid City is a um, uh, entity that was formed to run their square. The, it's a public gathering place, much like we're trying to build here locally. Uh, the space has been in existence for eight years. Mr. Sempner is a 36-year-old downtown business owner who kind of got frustrated when the mall was built. Their downtown was dying. Uh, he had a real desire to figure out a way to re-energize the community. Uh, and so out of that, I think the group that was there took had a lot of takeaways. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wanted you to be aware. I met with Mr. Zakian this morning to talk about our timeline and our next steps, because I think we owe it to the public to uh, be providing that. Uh, so I appreciate hearing that there's gonna be a public meeting. I'd, I'd like to encourage you and Mr. Zakian to have that public meeting at the Parker Senior Center across from what is proposed of our gathering space. Uh, and Mr. Zakian and I spoke about um, the discussion about establishing a bid district, a business improvement district. This was done in Rapid City. This helped not only create the capital to uh, help fund an organization that would run the space, but uh, also kind of talked about the larger ongoing issue of the operation and maintenance of the space. Um, so Mr. Zakin and I spoke about that this morning. Uh, we talked about the subrecipient agreement, trying to get that started with the park district. They're, they've been identified in the NDR application. Uh, so I, I think we need to start that process. And John was in agreement on that to, to really see what the park's role is going to be in this. Uh, I think the sooner we can start that, the sooner we can start talking about the overall organization that's gonna run this space because in Rapid City it was established six months to a year out of construction. And as Mr. Zakin and I spoke today, and we wanna do it right, yes, but we wanna move ahead. And our goal is to clearly break ground sooner than September of 2022 when the NDR funds have to be spent. Our goal is to do that 
ideally a year from now. And so our mayoral candidates are all in the room. I, I firmly expect that the public is going to be after those folks to transition and jump kind of on board to, to spearhead this and move it forward as well as our mayor has done. Um, so I did want to speak to those things because uh, there's energy coming out of our, our meeting in downtown Rapid City and uh, we're going to capitalize on it. And uh, so I just wanted the public to be aware of that because it, it, it's critical and important to a lot of people. The space in Rapid City revitalized $50 million in the community. It's 74,000 people in Rapid City. Clearly, we're not that. But uh, I think if we do it right and do it well, it can be inclusive and uh, it can be a, a huge uh, gain for this community. So I wanted to speak to that. And then finally, Mr. Mayor, if you'll indulge me one last time about the budget. Tom, I really appreciated you speaking about options because the public wants to hear the city's got priorities. What might we take off the table um, because we can't afford it? And I appreciate you saying that mainly because Mr. Gary Rasmussen is my neighbor and a firefighter that's in the back of the room. And I think all of us up here want to make sure that city staff are compensated. And if we're going to talk about that moving forward, we're going to have to prioritize what we're going to spend money on, what we're going to take off the table. So I appreciated you including that. So thank you. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Any thank other you. questions for, for Mr. Mr. Berry? Alderman Wolski. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you don't get as much time as straight. I understand <laughs> completely. Uh, Tom, I was greatly uh, appreciative of you bring, bringing up the street sweeping policy and the manner in which we're conducting this, because this is something that I've uh, wondered about. Um, and I was, in fact, going to request this as an, as an agenda item next month, uh, because I, I wonder if the manner in which we, we clean up our streets in the city might reflect more the the manner in which I think many of us probably take care of our homes when we're having guests, uh, which would maybe be to focus on our common areas, which I would think of as the commercial districts, um, the downtown area, the malls, the Burdick Expressways, uh, the Fourth Avenue Northwest. Um, I, I think it would put a nice foot forward if we concentrated on those areas first before we moved out into the residential neighborhoods and, and randomized the manner in which we went through those through the town. But um, I, I think I would like to consider the council to consider that policy change next month. So I don't know if, uh, if simply mentioning it here is enough to bring that forward, but I would appreciate that. Right. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, if I can turn to the Public Works Director, I think some of that is already occurring. Our major arterials, you correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Jonasson, but our major arterials are what we do first. I mean, if you've noticed travel on most of Burdick, for example, and most of uh, 80, uh, 83, you know, through or Broadway, through town, those, those streets are pretty well done. Um, and this work starts early also, um, you know, in an attempt to try to free up a lot of this from being run off, a lot of the sediment, for example, will be running off into the storm systems and that sort of thing. So uh, we are, to a certain degree, approaching it the way that you've just described. And perhaps what we can do is get you more information about that program. And, uh, and then you can determine whether or not if you feel that uh, some adjustments in that program are, are warranted based upon that. I I'll just, I, I appreciate hearing that, Tom. The reason I bring it up is, uh, and it was very early after the weather broke, we wouldn't have hardly been able to be out doing the work yet, but I was at, a, at an event in downtown. There was so much dust on the street, the wind uh, kicked up a, a little uh, mini cyclone, and uh, and it, it kind of uh, gave everybody a, who was hanging out at this event on the sidewalk, and there were a number of people there, a, a kind of a, a gritty experience, let's just call it that. So. Um, my hope is that, that if we were able to, to maybe make a slight adjustment, we might be able to, to clean those areas up a little quicker. But Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Barry? Get up here quick. All right. Thank you all. Um, city attorney report. Mr. Mayor, members of council, I submitted a written report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for the city attorney based on the written report? Seeing none, item number 12 is considered the report of the Planning Commission. There were five items on the agenda. What's the council's wishes? Mr. Mayor, I move the five items. Second. Moved by Janser, seconded by Sitma. Any discussion? What that means is that these five items will be passed as they came out of the Planning Commission. If there's something up there you want to discuss further, let us know. We'll pull that item for further discussion. Seeing no one, any discussion from the council? Call the roll. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Strait? Yes. Wolski? 
Yes. Barney. Yes. Item number 13 is considered the report of the Committee of the Whole from the May 1st, 2018 meeting. There were 25 items on the agenda. I would like item number 25 pulled. What's the council's wishes on the remaining items? Mr. Mayor, uh, I would add just a comment that item 22 uh, really isn't actionable by the, uh, the council. That was an item that we referred back to the Renaissance Zone Committee. Okay. Uh, Alderman Sitman, or a straight, sorry. It's all right, you're allowed. Uh, <laughs> will you pull item number 23, please, sir? 23. And Mr. Mayor, I would also request item 19. So that means all items except 19, 23 is going back. I'm sorry, 22 is going back, pulling 23 and pulling 25. Alderman Mr. Sitma. Mr. Mayor, I'd move approval on the remaining items, 1 through 18, 20, 21, and 24. Second. Seconded by Olson. Anybody out there want any of those items pulled? Let me know now, otherwise they'll go through as they came out of the committee. Any discussion up here? Call the roll. Sitma? Yes. Street? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Barney? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Motion carries. Item number 19, the recycling cost analysis, consultant selection. Have a motion? I'd move the item. Moved by Wolski? Second. Second. Seconded by Stray. Alderman Wolski. A uh, brief comment, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, I, I think we all received an email from a Mr. Tim Bauman recently speaking to uh, uh, his role in organizing an environmental policy and advocacy group. Um, and uh, one of the, the issues they are going to be uh, bringing forward is, is the idea that we may uh, need to induce some better behavior with regards to plastic bags. Um, I think the, the timeline or, or the policy that they're talking about uh, may at some point in the future ultimately uh, recommend uh, we ban the use of practic uh, plastic bags. And, and I wanted to call attention to this issue as it relates to recycling, just because this is something we're gonna have to be considering uh, on a holistic scale, because uh, this is an issue that'll no, no doubt be contentious. It will, it will bring forth all the, the polarizing labels that, that come forth when we have environmental discussions. Uh, but the reality is plastic bags have been uh, subsidized by the citizens and by the city for a very long time. And as we move into uh, recycling specifically, we're gonna have to subsidize them further. And so as we, as we talk about recycling, I just wanted to kind of have that on the record that, so that the community is aware of this conversation. And I'll be quiet now, we can. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, and for the Alderman Strait. Sorry, I guess I can't be. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Walski, to that point, and I, I responded back to Mr. Ballman today with kind of what were some of my suggestions, and I, I see his role moving forward as um, possibly working with our system public works director if we get to the point where we're uh, building this recycling educational campaign citywide, I think that would be very helpful because what I've learned from Jason in the discussions dating back to the recycling ad hoc committee till now is plastic bags are gonna cost us the recycling loads that we might talk about shipping. They affect the facilities that are gonna be recycling uh, our recyclables in the hopes that we might get some slight commodity price back. Uh, so I, I, I think it's gonna be a worthwhile discussion, but I think in the whole concept of recycling, uh, I appreciate Mr. Bauman's uh, uh, email, and I, I think he's gonna play a role in, in that discussion, so um, I appreciated you pulling it. I'm gonna remind the council that the, the motion on the floor is on the consultant selection. That would certainly be part of the conversation when the consultant is hired and we establish, uh, we can certainly send Mr. Bauman to uh, speak with the public works folks. Uh, on the motion uh, of uh, selection, any further discussion? Call the roll. Wolski? Yes. Barney? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Straight? Yes. Um, item number 23, is that right? Yes. Establishing a Renaissance Zone administrative application fee to cover costs. I have a motion. Move the item. Move by straight. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Janser. Discussion, who wanted this one pulled? Alderman Strait. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I guess I, uh, I, last week I made commit, um, comments at Committee of the Whole. I, I didn't.
work into these projects and um, so at this time I, I'd, I'd like to see this moved and held uh, so we can consider it one more month because um, I, I don't see it's real pressing that we have to decide this tonight but I'll heed to your wisdom sir. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, we have a motion on the floor, but I would actually move that we refer this back to the Committee of the Whole and request staff to, uh, to, to, to develop a little more uh, depth between the, the two models that have been proposed for us and clarify the, the percentage amounts. If my understanding is that a, a motion to send back takes precedence over the motion on the floor. Second. And there's also no uh, discussion on the... Mr. Mayor, you can discuss a motion to refer something back. Okay. Any further discussion on the motion to send it back? So close. Alderman Wolski. Just going to provide uh, clarity that this, this motion is to send it back to committee of the whole. Correct. I do think this is a financial issue that the, the council should deal with and not the Renaissance. Home. Agreed. Further discussion? Call the roll. Wolski? Yes. Barney? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Straight? Yes. Motion carries. Item number 25 is the Wildlife Management Program proposed ordinance and resolution. I asked to have this motion pulled so I could vote against it. So we all moved. knew that. So uh, <laughs> can we have a motion? Moved we'll by Sitma, of course. Second. Seconded by Wolski. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm sure you want to speak as well. Uh, come forward, please. For those of you in the audience who don't understand how this works, what happens is that I voted against this several times and I wanted it pulled from the consent agenda because I wanted to continue voting against it and the only way to do it is to pull it and vote against it. So uh, it's not a big deal, but I want to be able to do that. Yes, ma'am. Your name and address for the record, please. Uh, my name is Nan Jacobson, 701 10th Avenue Southeast in Minot. Uh, good evening. Uh, I still have uh, a few questions. I, when I spoke the last meeting, the meeting of the whole, um, I was thanked for my comments, but I really didn't get any answers. Um, one of them is the number of permits. The number of permits is 20. Is that my understanding? Um, Chief Olson, are you familiar with the answer to that question? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, it's 40 for this season. 40. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So uh, in the proposed ordinance, it says the city council hereby authorizes issuance of total of 20 Minot City Deer Management permits to participate in the 2018-2019 city wildlife management season. After submission of proper application along with a copy of the Minot City Deer Management Permit, each permit holder may initially purchase up to two special deer bow season licenses if available from the North Dakota Game and Fish Department's Bismarck office. After November 1, 2008, permit holders may purchase any of the remaining 40 North Dakota Game and Fish Department deer licenses on a first come, first serve basis. This sounds confusing to me. Okay. It, it sounds like it, it's 20, but there's 100 available. Mrs. Hendershot, do you have something to add? <laughs> Mr. Mayor, there are 20 permits that are available, but 40 licenses. So each person can get up to two licenses if somebody doesn't purchase two. And there are remaining out of the 40, the people who have permits can purchase those remaining ones after November. So there's a top stop of 40. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, also, I didn't see anywhere in the proposed ordinance whether um, genders were designated or identified. I, Alderman Wolski. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think I can speak to this. Uh, part of the, this program is the participation in the, the North Dakota Game and Fish is a herd reduction program, which is a, a, a program that, is, that goes through a governor's uh, proclamation. And, and I believe the definition that is included in all, and this is above and beyond the, the standard hunting a activities. This is specifically for herd reduction purposes. Um, and, I, and I believe it all applies to antler lists. Um, and, and that's the, the language that's used because it, towards later in the season, 
the, the deer, the, the male deer shed their antlers and, and sometimes it becomes difficult to tell. So um, this was discussed at the ad hoc committee and, and my assumption is, is that we've accounted for this in the development of the program. Thank you. Ms. Jacobson? Um, on the November 1st uh, ad hoc meeting, uh, Mr. Walski summarized what the committee has so far for requirement and concerns to consider does only no bucks. Um, now that brings the concern of the season. The regular bow season, it's my understanding, is September 1 to January 7th, and you've extended it through January, which is the time when it's my understanding in the northern latitudes that the uh, bucks do lose their um, antlers. So my question, again, is are we just going for both? Alderman Wilski? I, I can do my best on this, uh, Mr. Mayor. I, I think that the, there, there are two elements of this that are in play. There is the, the standard hunting practice, which may take place throughout the season. And, and I'm, I'm looking past you a little bit at Chief Olson, because if I misspeak, please correct me, Chief. Um, the, and then there is also the herd reduction element of this program. And so those two are treated slightly differently by North Dakota Game and Fish, and therefore also by by the city uh, would be my understanding. Um, but, but again, if I, if I mis misspoke there, Chief, please do. Um. Are you talking about the extension of the season through January 31? Okay, um, at that same ad hoc meeting, Mr. Waltz questioned if this program was to move forward, would there need to be a special season or would the city follow the game and fish hunting season? Mr. Gullickson stated, oops. <laughs> The city would, uh, could adjust the hunting season as some cities have extended into January. However, a change outside of the normal season would need to be approved by the governor. So have you received that then? It, we did get a notification and an email from, from our liaison at the North Dakota Game and Fish that, that Minot is set to be included in the governor's 2018-19 uh, hunting proclamation. Okay. So we're, we're to assume that that means it, that it's going to happen? I, I think yes. our assumption is that it's all pending these approvals here. Okay. Um, and then uh, one final question. I know I um, questioned earlier today, and I appreciate your response, uh, Alderman Walski and also Mr. City Manager, um, about the uh, fawns, because, of course, there's going to be fawns that are going to be born this spring. and. Uh, so do you want to reiterate that Alderman answer, please? Mayor, Ms. Jacobson, I'd be happy to address that, and, and thank you for bringing that to, to our attention, because it was an issue that, that I didn't have a, uh, an answer to prior to today. Um, and the concern was maybe what happens to the fawns if a, uh, if a, a mother doe is taken as a part of this whole program. And uh, so I reached out to Mr. Gullickson today to get a response and, and the, the opinion of a, a biologist um, and, and he indicated that by the time the hunting activity takes place and opens in the fall, uh, is uh, at that point the young deer are, are weaned, so they are no longer dependent on their, their mother for, for milk. Uh, so, so that was the first point. They, he also said that North Dakota Game and Fish has actually studied this issue, and they, the survival rate for those fawns is typically above 90%. Uh, so they have considered this in the past. Uh, and then uh, for, for what is left in some of the, the young animal learning that, that might be imprinted by, by their mother, uh, the, the herd mentality that, that deer exist in and their herd behavior typically supports uh, the, the traits that, are, that, that would still be being learned by that young animal at that point. Um, so this is an issue that has been dealt with uh, in the hunting world and the wildlife management world. And, um, Mr. Gullickson did not express any specific concerns regarding it. Okay. Ms. Jacobson. Two more quick ones. Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, in the ad hoc uh, committee meetings, also visibility, size, shot angle, and terrain of the land need a good backstop um, were part of the requirements and concerns to consider. I wanted to um, ask Chief Olson if, um, if, only areas allowed that have that are going to be allowed. Chief Olson. 
Mr. Mayor, members of the committee, so as part of the application process for applying for a City of Minot permit, the applicant will have to specify where it is that they are planning on hunting and provide proof that they have permission to hunt at that location. When that's submitted, then I will review the, the application and see if it's a suitable area to hunt, in, in my opinion. And that was essentially the direction of the, the committee that studied this was to leave those issues to the discretion of the chief. Thank you, Chief. Okay, and one last question I had was um, another concern of mine was um, hunters wearing orange um, and um, cones or signs put where the hunting is being done at the time. And when I brought it up in the ad hoc meetings, um, Mr. I can't remember who said it. Oh, um, the committee debated if a cone or flag should be set up when hunting is in progress, but Mr. Gullickson did not see that as necessary, especially considering where you would put it so everyone could see. I just really think that, you know, in the city, you're in city limits, and if someone sees a street clothed person walking around with a high powered bow, that's, that's a concern to me. Okay. As well. Thank you. Any questions for uh, Alderman Wolski? Uh, uh, I'll, I'll speak to that last concern very briefly here. Um, uh, we, we did have that discussion in ad hoc committee. Uh, th there were some logistical challenges that it presented in terms of uh, m some places may be ac accessible by, by several points, and so it became very difficult to identify where that particular notification could go. Um, it also became, uh, uh, the, also, the idea was also brought forward that um, if, if there is notification of that particular activity, uh, there may also be attempts to disrupt that particular activity, which may create a, a maybe an even un more, or a, a less ideal circumstance. So uh, the committee addressed the issue and, and ultimately did come to this con this recommendation that we're, we're dealing with here. Okay. Thank okay, you. I just hope that notification is given to, you know, people in the area because as, as one of my main concerns is children and citizens of Minot who are not aware of what's happening. It could be a very dangerous situation. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Jacobson. Further discussion on the item? Uh, Chief Wilson. Mr. Mayor, members of the committee, I just wanted to ask that the uh, council consider. Could you pull the microphone up? Because, yeah, there you go. I just Thank wanted you. to ask that the council consider uh, amending one of the penalties to either the uh, proposed ordinance for the penalty of the wildlife management. Uh, ordinance, which is a B misdemeanor, and the penalty for 23-68, which is hunting in the city limits, is an infraction. And since those are very similar activities, essentially covered uh, by two different ordinances, I believe the penalties should be the same. I don't have a preference whether it's a B misdemeanor or an infraction for both, but uh, and I've discussed this with the city attorney, and she's prepared to change one of them one way or the other for the second reading. Uh, okay, would you like to make that amendment now? Or we're gonna wait? It could be done now or before second reading, either Do way. Do it a second reading. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody else? Anybody else? Call the roll. Sitma? Yes. Straight? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Barney? No. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Uh, item number 14 is consider the report of the Committee of the Whole from the May 2nd, 2018 meeting. We had 23 items on that agenda. Items 1, 2, and 3 have been addressed in prior action. What's the committee's wishes on the remaining items? Mr. Mayor. Alderman Janser. I'd move consent on the remaining items. Mr. Mayor, I, I would, uh, well, we have a motion on the floor. Second. We have a second. Do you want something pulled, Alderman Wilski? I was going to request we pull item 21 and, uh, Item 23. Okay. Again, for those of you in the audience, the remaining items uh, that you see up there will be passed as they came out of uh, the committee of the whole meeting. If there's something up there you want to discuss further, 
uh, let us know and we will pull that item for further discussion. Seeing no one, uh, call the roll on the consent agenda. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Strait? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Barney? Yes. Item number 21, MI5-P3529, uh, MRE FPP. Alternatives for consideration. Moved. Moved by Wolski. Second. Seconded by Janser. Alderman Wolski? Yeah, a uh, question for Mr. Jonathan on something that uh, Mr. Jonathan, me over the weekend. Mr. Jonathan, come forward, please. Dan, uh, in, in reviewing the, those uh, pictures we looked at and, and drawings from last week, one of the things that, I, that caught my attention over the weekend was the trees between the proposed uh, holding pond and the levee and the river. Um, are, are those trees gonna need to be removed? That they're, they're gonna be down basically in the floodplain on the wet side of the flood protection features, uh, and there are a number of old ones down in that neighborhood, it's a historic area. And so I was just curious where, what the status is on those particular trees. Mr. Mayor, Alderman Wolski, um, right now, I can't give you a definite answer on that. Certainly anything that's within 15 feet of the new uh, levee that would be going up, um, any trees would have to be removed. Uh, but uh, some of the other trees in the area could be left. Keep in mind though that this area serves as uh, storage area. So having trees in there, uh, you know, if they become flooded, they will probably die off um, anyway. So uh, a certain amount of them will be removed for uh, right along the alignment of the new levee and the flood features uh, to keep them away from the, the clear zone that the core requires on that. Uh, but the rest of it will be determined more as the project progresses. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you, Dan. If uh, you know we're in this input gathering process, so I'm going to simply share my comments that uh, um, if there is a way to save those trees and they are not required to be removed as a part of flood protection, uh, that is something that I'm going to be uh, advocating for along the way because I think uh, we we experienced as a city, as a community, the the loss of the trees that recently had to come down as a result of uh, phases one, two, and three moving forward. Uh, and, and if we don't need to take them, I, I don't want to be taking them. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jonathan. Further discussion on the item? Call the roll. Wolski? Yes. Barney? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Straight? Yes. Motion carries. Item number 23 is the 2019 budget pri principles and priorities. Have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Wolski, seconded by Sitma. Alderman Wolski. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think we've got uh, a good basis to move forward on the budget process here. There was a news story that caught my attention today that I wanted to just bring forward and, and, and mention briefly. Um, and I'm gonna read the lead here from the first paragraph. Um, Illinois needs to come up with 20 bi 21 billion a year to pay for repairs to infrastructure according to a new report. Um, as, as we move forward with all the plans and, and the, the everything we're considering as a city. The, the ongoing maintenance and the future replacement costs, costs are, are gonna be something that we need to be very, very careful of because uh, I, I don't think we have a sense of what those are until they come due. And in many cases, lots of our new developments and, and roads and infrastructure in the last few years are not gonna be coming due for several years. And uh, I, I think we need, to, we need to be prepared to talk about the price tag for that right now when we're making these decisions. So I just wanted to share that comment. Okay, thank you. Further discussion on the item? Call the roll. Wolski? Yes. Barney? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Straight? Yes. Motion carried. Item number 15 in our ordinances on second reading. Approval. Mo moved by Olson. Second. Seconded by Janser. Discussion on that? Discussion? Call the roll. Olson? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Straight? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Barney? Yes. Janser? Yes. Motion carried. Item number 16 is administrative approvals. So moved. Moved by Sitma. Second. Seconded by Janser. Discussion? Discussion? Call the roll. Sitma? Yes. Straight? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Barney? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. 
Item number 17 is other business. 17.1 is earth recycling at all versus the city of Minot. Mr. Mayor. Alderman Janser. Mr. Mayor, I move that the city council authorize the city's legal counsel to file an immediate appeal to the North Dakota Supreme Court in the event the district court denies the city's motion to dismiss. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by SIPMA. Any discussion on the motion? Any discussion? Call the roll. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Street? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Barney? Yes. Motion carries. Item number 18 is adjournment. I move we adjourn. Moved by Janser. Second. Seconded by Sitma. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? We're adjourned. <laughs>